Hello everyone, Mark Latham here. I thought I'd give you an update, as promised, as to uh, where I am and also uh, my wife and uh, Louise Good as well. She's uh, joined uh, the activist group in our area uh, with regards to some of the child protection policy issues that we've been dealing with. And um, so we do have an update, but it's, it's worth keeping everybody as to where we are right now. And it's taken a very, very long time to get to this stage. But uh, we are breaking boundaries, we are exposing things, and uh, so as we continue to go forward, it's probably best to just keep everybody up to date with what's happened so far. In 2013, uh, I wrote some letters to the Child Safeguarding uh, Board, and uh, the, uh, also the Ch Child Abuse Investigation Teams, which is the uh, police department in our Gloucestershire County and social services, along with a, number, a whole host of other letters that are sent out to different people. All of these letters, uh, I actually sent out copies of much of the leaked letters that I had received that were on, are now actually broadly available on the internet for other, everybody else to see. So this is, this is not uh, stuff that uh, is out there that's, that's top secret. It is top secret to the Watchtower Society, but not to the, uh, the rest of the world, because we all now know what are, is, is actually in those, those leaked letters. So what am I getting at here? Well, to start with, I wrote those letters. I got in contact with my MP at the time, and I demanded that uh, action was taken regarding what uh, I saw and what many of us see as a complete injustice to children who happen to be Jehovah's Witness children when it comes to the whole area of child abuse and how they are handled within that particular belief system. So I shared with the authorities all of my information and as a result of that there was a uh, police uh, investigation that took place in Gloucestershire where a group of senior elders were summoned to a meeting to discuss the policies of the safeguarding policy of Jehovah's Witnesses in the UK. So this, this actually took place uh, as a result of um, me basically stirring it up and showing everybody exactly what was going on behind the scenes. So that's what happened. Uh, the police, uh, in their own words to me when we were talking about this on the phone, uh, asked me uh, what sort of questions, are there any other particular questions that we should be asking these this group of men that are coming to this meeting? And I gave them some relevant questions to ask the elders based on the information that was their own literature and to ask them to basically uh, come out with the real truth about what goes on. But I also warned the police at the time that uh, this this is something that although I would love for the elders to actually be truthful, the, the actual aspect of them being truthful is another matter because all they will do is smile at you, shake your hand, tell you that they will fully cooperate and then give all of the information straight to branch office to deal with. I said, so you won't get anywhere. As it turned out, that's exactly what happened and I had a report back from the police that that's, that's what happened at the end of the day. And I gather from, from the type of questions that they were asking that they too were very frustrated at this veneer that takes place between uh, common sense and the reality of what was written in these, these hidden documents and actually how they handle this stuff and believe that they're doing the right thing. So right in front of me I have a letter here April 12, 2013, from the Watchtower that went to my Chief Constable in Gloucestershire uh, by the name of uh, Suzette Davenport. I also have here a letter from Edward Timpson, who is the Under Secretary of State for Children and Families. And I also have the uh, Child Safeguarding Policy for the Watchtower Bible and Tract Study for the UK. I also have a paedophile list, that's uh, a list that's uh, uh, those that have been convicted of paedophilia within the Watchtower Bible and Tract Study in the UK over the last four years. And also I have the October 1st 2012 widely distributed letter on the internet that is a leaked letter now regarding the infamous letter to the body of elders on how they should handle child abuse. I don't intend to go through all of this because, uh, because of time, 
But I want to make it clear that the one letter that's really of interest to me that I want to share with everybody is this Watchtower letter that came out recently that I actually managed to get, a, get hold of. It has taken me basically well over a year, a year and a half to get this letter and uh, I finally have it in my possession. And it came from my MP because my MP was forwarded into this and he is my MP Watchtower. So if you're watching this, if you want to start claiming copyright and everything else, he is our elected official. He works for us. It was him I went to in the first place. And it was him that, like me, was showing great concern for the policies and procedures that your shower are actually holding out to what they, you believe to be protecting children. Anyway, this is the letter that was eventually sent from branch office, or shall we say the legal department of the Watchtower, to the police department here in Gloucestershire. And I'm going to break it down piece by piece because there, there needs to be some sort of truth added to this so you can see exactly where, where, it's, uh, where it's gone. Try to imagine that you are the police. Try to imagine that you are the child safeguarding uh, board uh, in, in our county. Try and imagine that you are the social services looking at this stuff. You're an outsider looking at this religious faith. And this is the letter based on the questions that the police gave to the Watchtower. This is the return letter that took them many months to reply to. Dear Madam, we are in receipt of the letter of March 18th, 2013 from Detective Inspector Mark Chicken, Child Abuse Investigation Team, addressed to our legal department and copied to Mr. Martin Horwood, MP, who is my MP. In this, D.I. Chicken refers to Jehovah's Witnesses' child safeguarding policy as adopted by congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses in the United Kingdom and Ireland, a copy of which was provided for him at a meeting with um, with local congregation elders. Well, this was the meeting that they were summoned to, to answer the questions. And as a result of that, they gave him a copy of this particular child safeguarding policy. Okay. He cites a concern that has been raised direct with the MP's office. Well, that will be me. That was me that raised the concern. And it wasn't just a concern, it was a whole plethora of information to go with that concern, showing quite clearly the evidence shows that Watchtower, as far as I was concerned, was not actually following through with any guidelines built into the country's churches and faith systems, but also was actually looking to work against it based on those secret letters to all bodies of elders. So yes, the uh, concern was raised by me to my MP's office and elaborates that these concerns centre around the use of elders to resolve child protection concerns within a congregation rather than these being correctly reported to the proper appropriate authorities, the police and social care. And also the two witness rule, inverted commas, reg rule regarding allegations made against Jehovah's Witnesses. While we are grateful that D.I. Chicken has taken the tr trouble to state his concerns, we note that they are unspecific and do not include any reference to statute. So I'm going to stop there. This is the second paragraph in, first sentence, and that's exactly what it says. We are grateful to D.I. Chicken, who has taken the trouble to state his concerns. We note that they are unspecific and do not include any reference to statute. In other words, what are you getting at? What, what are you trying to get at here? We're, have you got something to say to us? Because you're unspecific in any particular case. And also, can you quote which particular legal statute we are in breach of? And then they sit back from this point onwards in the letter and then get cocky. The policy was formulated with the help of appropriately qualified professional secular advice. So now I want you to listen to this very carefully. I'm going to give you four bodies of people that they claim make up the child safeguarding policy for the UK. And I'm presuming the same template for the rest of the world. But here it is. It was formulated with the help of appropriately qualified professional secular advice including fully qualified independent experts and leading counsel and of the spiritual leadership of the faith. Now, we are confident that it both complies with the law 
and provides appropriate safeguarding for children in the context of our faith and community activity. And there's the important word, activity. So let's break this down a little bit as to where we're going because once I read the next paragraph, it really does absolve them from any responsibility towards the legal aspects of what could be deemed uh, that they should be involved with. So I'm going to read the next paragraph and then we can actually just see exactly what the Watchtower is up to here. It would be otious to repeat the full provisions of the 53 page policy, this booklet here, but we wish to draw your attention in particular to clause one. All children have the right to be protected from abuse. Of course they do, yes. Clause 2. Safeguarding children is of the utmost importance. We abhor child abuse and consider it to be a serious sin and um, a crime. Clause 3. Jehovah's Witnesses do not condone child abuse under any circumstances or endeavour to shield from the authorities those committing offences of this nature. I'll come back to that one in a second. Clause 5. The congregation does not and will not provide or sponsor any activities that fall within the scope of regulated activity relating to children, as defined in the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act of 2006, as amended from time to time and equivalent legislation in other parts of the United Kingdom and Ireland, including such activities as creches, playgroups, Sunday schools, youth groups, clubs, choirs or camps. In addition, the policy expressly provides for congregation elders to comply with any, inverted commas, relevant laws. Clause 10, to ensure that parental responsibility holders, but with the exclusion of alleged abusers, become aware of allegations as soon as is practicable. And clause 13, and in cases when a child may still be at risk of significant harm, as defined by law and decided cases, once again, inverted commas and brackets, to make measures to ensure that the matter is reported to the police or the appropriate authorities. All right, I just want to explain exactly what that means. There's something that we had to study quite a lot, extensively, really, to get to the bottom of this. They have basically absolved themselves from any responsibility due to the fact that they are ironically using the law to protect them from any of these responsibilities. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act of 2006. They don't believe they're a part of that because they don't support all of the creches, the playgroups, Sunday uh, schools, youth groups, clubs, choirs and camps. They don't get involved in any of that stuff. They don't sponsor any of that stuff. So as a result of that, they're not actually included in the 2006 Act. And do you know what? They're correct. They don't. Because officially, they're not working with children, officially. Now, keep hold of your seats, everybody, because I can feel some people gripping their seats already and gritting their teeth at some of this stuff. But this is exactly what they've written in this letter um, of April 12th, 2013. So there, is it, there it is. This is the I irony to this, that they're using this particular act, the 2006 Act, to actually be able to hide behind that and comply with the relevant laws, as they call it, or in this case, the non-relevant laws, as it may be deemed. The reason that Jehovah's Witnesses are not breaking the law is because there is no law to break. And so I'm going to come on to this in my conclusion in a second. But here's a question for you. I'm going to finish off this letter at the last bit. And this too is very interesting. The so-called, and I quote, the so-called two-witness rule, inverted commas, has no relevance to the reporting of crime to secular authorities. This is pastoral canon, which is founded in scripture and does not appear in the policy statement. It has no relevance to the reporting of crime to secular authorities, the two-witness rule. No relevance at all. They do not see the relevance of this this clergy privilege with actually the law and they're making that very clear is it morally right that they're doing that no it's indefensible but they're allowed to say it because there's nothing in law saying that they don't have to comply with any other format here that's the format 
The lawyers are very, very astute at knowing this. Finally, I wish to assure you that we take these issues very seriously. Indeed, we believe that our policies and procedures are not only entirely compliant with the law in this country, but also in compliance with the highest moral and ethical principles. Even in situations where the law might not be clear, we are motivated by the Bible's high moral values to take appropriate steps to protect children from the horrors of sexual abuse. The highest moral and ethical principles. Interesting. Okay, well that's the letter. And they're talking there that the, uh, the relevance of the two witness rule is that there is no relevance to it and the reporting of it to any of the authorities. They see the two as completely separate. Well, to an outsider looking on, you could look at that and you, you, as, a, as the authorities, they can see that this is very disturbing. The police said to me that we've read through those documents and if those documents are true, and we've got no reason to doubt you, Mr. Latham, they are extremely disturbing on how they manage the abuse of children. Uh, but when it comes to the law, they are extremely restricted as to what they can do about this whole issue with the Watchtower in the UK and how they deal with paedophiles within their ranks. They make out there that they use the highest moral standards and ethical standards to, to protect their children. Okay, here's a list here um, of Jehovah's Witnesses that have been convicted as paedophiles in the past four years. Sewell, Rogers, Rose, Connor, Bill, Abbott, Ward, Leighton, Capazzo, Collins, Telfer, Lelou, Evans, Gandley, Wood, Bain, Drury, Danger, Lefkovich, Burns, Gold, Redman, Bridge, Cockerill, Massey. Those are the ones in the last four years that have been found out. And where are the others? Well, we know where the others are, because in these secret letters, we can see very clearly that when an individual is, is under the two witness rule, and there is only one witness, it ends up in an envelope, locked away in a file. The highest ethical attitudes towards this and principles? I don't think so somehow. And this is the stuff that the police are really concerned about, because it's going nowhere. Now, Another thing when you look into this stuff is the child safeguarding policy, this, this public booklet, and I know that Louise Good has been doing some excellent work on this recently and has just posted a letter that went out on the internet outlining within her critique, critique exactly all the flaws within this particular policy. And one of the main themes that she was looking at was the whole area of the safeguarding elder. Now the safeguarding elder, according to this, is someone that the public can ring and ring to the Bethel to say, I want to speak to the safeguarding elder because I've heard that little Tommy has just been molested or raped in a cupboard somewhere in the congregation. Now, when they ring through, they get nowhere. They don't even get a name. They get absolutely put off from saying anything else because there is nowhere for them to go. It isn't a safeguarding elder that they're speaking to. They're actually speaking to a representative of the legal department. Whether or not that's a lawyer, we don't know. But it's flawed all the way through. It has holes in it all the way through. It does not conduct itself in an appropriate manner that shows clearly that it is actually protecting the safeguarding interests of children. Now, this letter makes that very clear that above all that, the highbrow letter that we have here is saying that we're not breaking any laws. We're not breaking a single law here. And we are confident of that. So, although this detective inspector is saying that uh, he's concerned about it, well, show us. You're unspecific. You're not giving us any cases. And you're not giving any, any cases in statute, law. Show us where we're in breach. And this is what it's coming down to. The fact is that the law does not defend the children when it comes to faith groups. It's purely voluntary. It isn't there. And so this is where we now just need to start looking at policy changes and start to look a little bit deeper. A letter that Edward Timpson sent to my MP is a result of letters that I was sending to Edward Timpson and my MP at the time. And I quote in part a letter that he sent. 
Uh, there are clear duties in this country in relation to staff or volunteers who work closely and regularly with children. Well, the witnesses say we don't work with children regularly. We don't get involved in any of that stuff. So they abscond from any responsibility. But let's carry on. Any organisation, including a church, that removes a paid or unpaid worker from such work, all would have, if the worker had not left first due to harm or risk of harm to a child, has a legal duty to refer that person to the disclosure and barring service. And it gives a, 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 the website you can go on. It is an offence if an organisation fails without good reason to refer in such a case. It is also an offence if an organisation knowingly uses a barred person for such work. Now I think there's still room for some testing on that particular legislation because I do believe they fall straight into that one where we see and we've got the leaked letters to prove it that they still approve of convicted paedophiles being brought back into the congregation some of them many years later to become ministerials and servants and elders and taking up posts of responsibility. Where the case is weak against the Watchtower is they are absconding from the 2006 Act and so therefore you cannot lynch them into it. And this is where it's becoming very difficult. So we've decided that um, after careful thought there needs to be some changes in our tactics. It's not only uh, a matter of us reporting all of this uh, rancid procedural process that, that, that they use that they say are of the highest um, where does it say it? that they are of the highest ethical, the highest moral, moral and ethical principles? That if they're getting to this point where they're saying this, then they're getting very cocky with exactly what they're talking about here, and arrogant, I might add. But there again, the law is the law, and if they're not breaking the law, then they can carry on and continue with the policies that are in place. So here it is. We have already written letters now to uh, our MP and we have, they've now, now been sent off to Parliament again because we need to start looking at the law changes, those that have the power to change the law. We want, for instance, at the very least, to have mandatory reporting brought into this country where all groups, all faith groups, are uh, listed and are then in a position to legally be obligated to report all allegations of abuse straight to the police and the authorities. That does not happen yet and therefore they get away with that one. And also we're looking at other issues regarding whether or not the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society should also be included in the inquiries that are taking place as we speak today within Parliament. And I have demanded that the Watchtower Society be at least added into the mix to show that this is a faith group that at the very least is extremely questionable in how they actually look at their children and protect their children. One last point is the 2012 letter. And they talk there about the, the two witness rule of being an irrelevance. But they actually put whole pages to the two witness rule and actually make it clear that it is extremely important to them. And I want to finish with just one point here, one particular point. When, who is considered a known child molester? This is taken from the letter, the October 1st, 2012. Who is considered a known child molester? Well, it talks there that only uh, keep in mind that the branch office, not the local body of elders, determines whether one who has sexually abused a child is considered a known child molester. I'm going to leave the video on that. Keep in mind that the branch office, not the local body of elders, determines whether one who has sexually abused a child is considered a known child molester. I'll keep you updated as we carry on. We're not going to give up. There are more of us joining this fight now across the world and we will get the laws changed. I don't care how long it takes. We're going nowhere and we want to see the, uh, the tanker, this ship that the watchtower is on, change direction because if they won't change it, we'll get the law to change it for them. Thank you for listening and for your patience. Bye for now.